This is FX Radio, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. With me in the studio today is Dr. Mark Donohoe, a GP of many years' experience and some renown in treating quite complex energetic and methylation issues, and we're going to be talking to him today about the issues surrounding methylation. Welcome, Mark. How are you? Good to be back. Mark, it's a huge conundrum, this methylation um, pathway, because... You know, in around about 30% of people, there's this SNP, there's this gene polymorphism that affects how we use nutrients. Can you explain a little bit about that and how these patients present? Yeah, I, I think the simple explanation is biology does experiments and genetics reflect the varying experiments so that we are, you know, we find ourselves adapted or maladapted to our current environments. Methylation is sometimes called one carbon metabolism mm. and really... It's nothing more than the shifting of a carbon and three hydrogens from molecule to molecule. It happens trillions of times every second, and it is evolved in many, many pathways. So efficient methylation is, generally speaking, a good thing for quality of life. The trouble is, biology experiments, it overmethylates some people and it undermethylates others. And in biological terms and evolutionary terms, that experiment's worthwhile because sometimes the environment suits the overmethylator, sometimes the undermethylator, and biology doesn't put all its eggs in one basket. What we call normal is a variation on a kind of continuum, on a normal curve. Mm -hmm. So as doctors, we face the question of could this person be running into a problem because of poor methylation, low quality, inability to shift carbon and hydrogen onto, uh, say, the DNA to stop transcription, the inability to, say... Um, prevent inflammation once uh, infections get going. Very few people, for example, know that glandular fever virus is stopped by that methylation process, that we methylate the Epstein-Barr genome to stop it becoming a long-term uh, illness. And so the low methylators tend to be those ones that get viral illnesses that proceed on and on because they can't stop the genome being kind of replicated for the virus. So, so sorry to, to butt in there, but that to me seems kind of like a, a parallel to the uh, glucose 6-dehydrogenase pathway protecting against malaria. Yes. So, yeah, so things that we think of as defects or things that we think of as benefits, they, they all just do biology. Mm. And what we experience as illness, or in our case, what our patients experience as illness, we practitioners are forever trying to place them in that kind of jigsaw puzzle of, well, what's missing? What's mm. different about this person? I mean, I, I have a concept that there's every person in their genome carries hundreds of trapdoors. And if you never tread on them, you do fine in life. You would never know that you had, say, a tendency to autoimmunity. You'd never know that you had a tendency to cardiovascular disease because the environment, diet, lifestyle, all of those things work in your favour. No pressure is put on those pressure points. But when people get sick, what I find is that they normally line up one or two different things and the methylation disorders, as in abnormal methylation genetics mm. in my practice, are closer to 80% than the roughly 30% that you would see out in the wild. Is that because of a skewed uh, population that you're seeing? Definitely You're is. seeing the sick ones. Yeah, I'm seeing to... sick people. Yeah. And so uh, doctors uh, in nutrition, we get into this, so we think everybody must have this disorder. And it's not one disorder. If all you carry is a heterozygous snip of a methylation gene, you'll probably get through life fine. But mm. if you carry celiac genetics, plus that, plus you get infections, plus you run down and with stress, the combination of those finds the weak spot and the fixing of the methylation, it's, it's a kind of fixable issue that doctors are keen on. You know, mm. we like a pill for every ill. Yeah. We can do something about methylation, so we focus on it and say, I could give you something for that. And that, I think, is both risky and beneficial. Methylation is very trendy right at the moment, mm. but we are attacking it with a sledgehammer. We are going at it as though everybody needs the same treatment and everybody who's a poor methylator must be pulled back into the so-called normal range. So let's look at these patients and how they present. What do they come in to you seeking help with or from? Well, this will cross over with our discussion later on mitochondria as well, but methyl poor methylators on the whole do fine through life until something puts a challenge on them. You can pick the families with the family history because when dads die at, you know, 45 years of age or they've got angina from 35 years of age, you're pretty confident that that's likely to be a low methylator. That's going to be somebody where the methylation defect, the low function defect, has had an impact 
and the genetics are inherited. So these MTHFRs, which are the kind of hot investigations mm. at the moment, mm. you'll find that dad has contributed abnormal genetics. So we pay close attention to young males who are getting cardiovascular symptoms, the calcification, the inflammation on the arterial walls, and the risk of premature death is very, very high. Now, this finally goes back to the story before where what we measured was homocysteine. And so for decades, while I was going through medicine, homocysteine was thought to cause heart attacks. Now, funnily enough, this dragged cardiologists into the area of nutrition. They had to figure out how to drop homocysteine. Mm. And so what they did was gave multi-B vitamins. And they found that you could drop the homocysteine just by giving high-dose multi-B vitamins, problem cured. I think now, well. <laughs> decades down the line, we realized that what we were doing was giving a bit of B6, a bit of zinc, maybe a bit of cyanocobalamin, a bit of folate. And that the combination of those was pulling a few people, pulling their homocysteine down, but not necessarily changing cardiovascular. No, that's right. And I, I, I like to make the distinction here that if you've got pre-existing um, cardiovascular disease, it's kind of like trying to cure a neural tube defect with folic acid. Mm. It's not going to work. Yeah. No, you're quite right. And I think the sophisticated line now is, okay, there is a contribution of a methylation factor. If your dad or brother or a male relative has had premature cardiovascular disease, I think everybody deserves at least to have a test of their own homocysteine. But homocysteine only really shows up with one variant of that MTHFR. Mm -hmm. And the, the 677T variant is typically associated with raised homocysteine. The 1298C is not associated with raised homocysteine. So you can't just sit back and be lazy and accept the, that homocysteine is the surrogate marker. So what do you test for? It's a good question. You, I think now the answer is that you do the genetic tests. I, I think that it's reasonable, even though we've got a fairly abbreviated set easily available to us, you can do the 677 and the 1298 variants. And for those people who show the low function methylation variants of those, you've got a reason to act. You've got then a basis to go and say, well, we can change that. We can change the expression of those genes to bring them back to what we regard as more normal function. That does some good things for people, but it also has the risk of doing bad things. Mm. And I, I think this idea that we all know what low function and high function are is actually not true. I think that what we've got is a complex methylation system. Our body spends a lot of genes on getting the job of, methyl of the methyl transfers just right. And because of that complex system, we take one or two measurements and we make assumptions about the rest. As good clinicians, what we then do is go and treat a person, they get sick, and mm. we go, oh, God, that's not the right answer. But that's a, that's a kind of um, clinician's approach to, I take a test, I'm going to fix you. Oh, if I made you worse, I know why I've made you worse. So we do have to be cautious about that. But, it, I mean, in simplest terms, with raised homocysteine, with methylation gene disorders, you can usually rely on methylfolate, methyl B12, B6 in some form, and zinc to do what we hope is the transfer, which is take the homocysteine, pull it back through the methylation cycle, and produce glutathione. So we are after a sulfation kind of response from all of this, and we're after better function. That methylation is critical to, say, stress hormones. Whether they're active or inactive in the body is critically dependent on methylation. Neurotransmitters critically dependent on methylation. And so you do see neurological conditions, anxieties, depressions. You see a lot of neurological conditions related to this disorder. Not usually primarily presenting that way except in childhood. Mm. But when stresses rise, some people don't handle them well and fixing the methylation can be a very beneficial thing to do. Yeah, it seems to me that um, kids especially have been pigeonholed into uh, if they be present with behavioural disorders, let's first look at methylation. But adults, let's look at other things first and methylation issues yeah. later. Yeah, so you can tell the antidepressant prescription rate isn't going down at all for mm. adults. We still think of depression as if it's a disease rather than a symptom. And we talk about it as a fixable disease through pharmacology. And if we go backwards and we were to be smarter and to do some of this looking at the health of kids and their diet and the impact of diet, lifestyle 
find out what they're, you know, from that spectrum disorder of autism, from the hyperactivity disorder, if we paid attention there, adulthood could be a lot better mm. for a lot of people. So let's look at diet now because, uh, you know, there was a paper, oh gosh, six, eight months ago, middle of 2014, early 2014, that spoke it, just about improving the diet in behavioural disorders in kids, improved their outcomes. So what do you do first off when you're looking at dietary interventions with um, methylation issues? Do we, do we look at certain vegetables? Do we look at um, foods that might increase glutathione? That almost seems like adjusting the deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, the, <laughs> the first thing to do for the majority of the kids yeah. is get them off sugars, yeah. get them onto living fresh foods, get them uh, away from the colours, flavours, the preservatives, uh, get them eating meals. I mean, getting kids mm. to eat meals and sit down and chew food in front of a family, they are the really, really big questions. If you get fresh foods, fresh vegetables, and you can get kids to eat that stuff, a lot of the methylation challenges are in fact looked after just as well as going in with powerful supplements, medications, or mm. anything else. So I still see the big job of the integrative practitioner as convincing families that diet and lifestyle and getting exercise and getting oxygen into your system and getting a dog and losing mm. weight, those are the really big ones. There are plenty of kids who, even when you've done all of that right, still have clear behavioural disorders. And then you get down to a lot more subtly. Can you do something about brain chemistry? And the things that we tend to manipulate tend to be the folinic acid, the B12, um, zinc, the B6. There are a lot of tools that we can fiddle around with, but I caution every practitioner that the moment you think you understand it, you'll give somebody something that you're sure is going to work and it will make them 10 times worse. Mm. And the parents will come back upset with you because of all the unknown variables. We don't know all those other genes down the line. And I hope that one day we'll get to the point where we can get a good concept of methylation and know what its part is in the whole of health. But right at the moment, little snippet here, little snippet there, we know a bit Sometimes that's dangerous. Mm. There's a lot of controversy and, and practitioners are, are screaming out for the activated forms of certain B mm. vitamins, especially the cobalamins and folates. Can you take us through what are the different forms and how do they act? It's not, it's not that complicated. I think what practitioners scream about is we think methylation and therefore we think methyl everything is the ideal. And so we do have methyl folate not available in Australia. Mm. Uh, we do have methyl B12 not available in Australia, but they're typically the things that are used by practitioners overseas. And it's typically what's used by patients once they read on the internet, they go to iHerb and then they promptly order these things, make themselves sick and then come back and wonder why. Mm. But I think that if we think of B12 and folate as of dance partners, that if you have one, the B12's job is to recycle the folate, the folate's job is to do its work in the uh, uh, central nervous system. We have to be cautious about ever giving a person just B12 or just folate. You tend to want to give those together or at mm. least make sure fresh fruit and vegetables are very high if you're giving B12. So that dance is, is best managed if we had better access to products. But we live with a TGA and we live with... A, a listing for cyanocobalamin, not perfect, but in terms of practicalities of delivery, 95% okay. You can deliver the cyanocobalamin. There is a cyanide release, but it's at milligram or microgram doses. And we would ideally like to be able to use the methylated or the hydroxocobalamin. Doctors can pick it up and they can order an injection. So we do have a way around it as doctors. The folate, the tough one is folic acid because it's thought of, and that's the term that we use so mm. much for folate. We think folic acid, but folic acid is the synthetic folate, which is the hardest of all the folates to actually convert to the active form. Mm. And if you give a lot of folic acid, you can clog up those whole systems, the MTHFR systems that normally bring it through. So folinic acid, a lot closer to the target molecule. Even folinic acid is one step away from the methylfolate. And the methylfolate tends to be the one that we use. In the body for B12, we have the methyl and the adenosyl B12. Those are the two forms. The adenosyl are largely for storage. And then when the B12 is out and active, the B12 is methylated itself and starts transferring those methyl groups. So, you know, as a practitioner, 
You'd ideally like to be able to use the full range. To me, the folinic acid and the methylfolate are the ideal things to use if we suspect that the folate is defective and don't give people the simple low-cost 5 milligram B, uh, folic acids. I, do, I just don't think that they work and they may make things worse. What about other methylation factors like uh, SAME, for instance, mm. which is it's a newer player. It's, a, it's still quite expensive, if you like, but it's got some real um, therapeutic claims. It behind. has, and, uh, and it, in the hands of a good practitioner or someone a bit experienced with it, I think it is very, very valuable. It's called a universal methylator for a really good reason. And that is, if you if you have got neurological symptoms, and especially if they're more on the depressive side rather than the kind of anxiety, mm. hyperactivity side, that sometimes it's really hard to get control with uh, methylfolate and methyl B12. And the SAMI provides a very useful form of sulfur, and so it promotes that sulfation response, which ends up as glutathione, protective of the brain, and it also has good antidepressant properties. A again, the cost and the dosage is controversial because people have very, very different responses to SAMI. Two patients will turn up and look exactly the same, and one will become hyperreactive and hyperresponsive and quite manic with a 400 milligram dose of SAMI. The other person, the depression is gone and they're settled and they're taking 1,600 milligrams of the SAMI and doing very, very well on it. So I think that that's one where a very specifically practitioners need to be involved. Patients go off to certain you know, retail outlets, mm. they get a lot themselves and they end up in crises that they just don't understand. So the caveats with SAMI, mm. anxiety, OCD? Yeah. yeah. Others? Well... If you're, if you're worrying about it, if things go wrong, it tends to be a hyperreactive nervous system. So you tend to have the problems also with chemically sensitive people, people who are sensorily overloaded, visually, you know, very sensitive to light, touch, to sound or smells. You have to be so cautious with the SAMI because it gives a boost, but that voltage increase is often detrimental to the person. There's also, remember, I mean, the methylation factors include the B6 and zinc. And, you know, we, we hear a lot about that with the pyroluria these days and with the kids who have got the cryptopyrols measured in the urine. But as part of that cycle of the production of glutathione mm. from homocysteine and the recycling of that and the whole methylation cycle, B6 in an active form is really useful. And I, I don't think anyone's really got a good understanding yet of uh, the B6 as uh, hydrochloride or P5P. There's lots of varieties. All of them claim to be different. But the question then is, well, how does that work in the patient? And mm. I haven't seen those differences. I, you know, I may be missing something very clear, but the pyridoxine hydrochloride got a bad name in the past because of tingling in the fingers and neuropathies at high no, dose. No, really high dose. Yeah. yeah, I know. I know it was. But the overreaction in medicine is now you see doctors, anyone who's got Happened tingles once. in the fingers <laughs> and you're on a multi-B vitamin, they say, oh, that's <laughs> got to be the B6 in there. You shouldn't be on that. It's poison. Yeah. And it's not. Yeah. It's really, really useful not only in dropping the cryptopyrols, but in improving the glutathionation and the protection on the brain. What about other nutrients? Uh, for instance, serine. Mm. Have you ever used that? And, and indeed, a new player that's, uh, it's, I think it's already been gazetted by the Therapeutic Goods Administration now in 2014, and that's um, glutathione, preformed. I didn't know that. I mm. didn't know that they'd been gazetted. If we could, I think... If you ask most practitioners in nutritional medicine, if we could reliably deliver glutathione to the organs that we want to get them to, that is a kind of holy grail. Often we're acting indirectly. A lot of the stuff when we do the methylation cycle is to improve the neurological or the brain levels of the glutathione. But if you could get reliably glutathione fully formed, delivered to the tissue, I think that would be a game changer when it comes to tissue protection and inflammation control. Mm. I think the, the the challenge now is going to be getting the appreciable dose to, yeah. as you say, improve tissue levels rather than um, just putting it in your mouth and even D, even serum levels. Yeah, and uh, that's always the that's always the case. Something looks good, and then the practicalities of it, the delivery systems are often the falling down point. You've got to get a lot in. It's got to be delivered to the tissue. When you take capsules or anything, there's a first pass through the liver and the liver is very, very hungry for glutathione. It will grab a lot of glutathione mm. and you will not make, m not much will get past that. So take us through a brief um, change in presentation when you're delivering the correct diet, a little bit of exercise, um, some mindfulness um, and some selected nutrients. Tell me what sort of changes you see or progression over a period of time. 
Well, generally, people get better. If you can achieve all that, you've already won it as a practitioner. Getting one of those things right is normally a struggle. I think the biggest struggle is getting people to believe that it's not just a pill that's going to get them better. Mm. They're getting them to believe that doing something with exercise can have an effect on emotion and mood. People just can't, can't handle that. It's like, well, that's crazy. That's exercise for weight. Why would it affect my mood? Mm. But get people out in the sunlight, get them walking, feeling like they're moving their body, building a bit of muscle, losing body fat. That changes a lot. Changing the diet around so that it's not high sugar, fresh foods in season and that there's a variability brings the microbiome into play. We now have microbes that help out with a lot of the tasks that we would otherwise be thinking of as just our own biochemistry. Mm. So inflammation control, the obesity type of uh, problems, even simple things like constipation, bloating and wind. People complain of that all the time when they've got these other illnesses. So I, th I think of that as the hardest job but the most worthwhile because it's no cost sustainable over a long period of time. I have a personal belief, and that is for the patients I see, organic food is really, really important to them. And we keep hearing from the dietitians, there's no difference when you burn them, they look the same. But living fresh organic food with no pesticides in it, with none of the glyphosate roundup, those kind of mm. chemicals in it, they're really, really valuable to nurturing the gut, providing that variability. It's like a fallow seals, se uh, fields over a season you get a benefit of the turnover of the microbiome and they do an enormous amount for mood and emotion. If you could control the gut, and I think of this with practitioners, if you said, what would you control? Inflammation's one thing and the gut is the other and they're tied together. If you get the gut right, you actually do an enormous mm. amount for inflammation. But having done all of those things, there are still plenty of people where we know the cardiovascular risk is high, where in women you see that there's huge variations of the sex hormones and the premenstrual syndrome. You see people's poor response to stress, that a stress comes along for some people, they deal with the stress and it washes off them. For the poor methylators, they hit with stress and that stress seems to kind of resonate, almost echo in their system indefinitely. And when people get their methylation cycles right, uh, yes, they have to do the stress reduction. There's no point, you know, pussyfooting around that mm. you've actually got to get the stress under control. But unlike those who then go for the next 10 years, always with that nervous system half depressed and half on edge, that anxious depression, when the methylation is right, that comes back under control. Sleep quality improves, melatonin improves, and that adrenal cycle where the melatonin drops in the early morning and the cortisol comes up starts to support them instead of being scrambled. I think uh, we're going to learn a heck of a lot more uh, about this quite a, a complex cycle here at the 2015 symposium. Yeah. Where yeah. you and there's going to be four other speakers. Yeah, that's going to be fascinating. I think that, you know, we need a masterclass from people that can bring a cardiovascular perspective, a neurological perspective, inflammation. You've, you've got really, really good expertise to start to tie this together. So it's great to have the abstract concept of methylation disorders. But what we mean, what we need is for that to be brought back to the practitioner to say, here's how it presents. Oh, and here's something that you can do practically that may change cardiovascular risk, that may improve neurological and psychological function, that may improve absorption and nutrition and inflammation. And weirdly, um, even endotoxicity, the ability of the body to be able to manage the toxins that it produces itself. So it's a fertile field and the uh, symposium is going to be a very, very interesting way of dealing with it. Mark, thanks once again for joining us in the studio today. I really appreciate how you, you give us an overall uh, perspective of what can be quite a, a, a complex cycle. It's not just a, a simple dance partner and something that we can easily attribute. It's more than uh, just the tip of the iceberg. And I really just look forward to hearing you MC at the Symposium 2015 and the way that you tie things in together. I'm looking forward to that as well. This is FX Radio. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook.